Hello, welcome back to uh, another now recording. We're finally going to finish the bees, uh, which has taken us a long time. I think this is the fourth bee video, but finally uh, we're going to be done with the bees and we can move on to C. Um, so uh, we have a handful of records to go through um, today, and uh, we're going to start with the man you see before you who passed away earlier this year, David Bowie. I have three David Bowie albums. Um, all of the albums today, except one, uh, came from my parents' collection, and I will um, talk about that one when we get to it. Uh, David Bowie is just something I'm just not familiar with, um, to be honest. I, I have never, I don't really know why, I just, I, I've never really kind of gotten around to it. I have friends who really like David Bowie. Um, of course, I know the famous songs, but I haven't listened to any of these three albums, uh, which I know I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for. Um, and uh, yeah, I just it's just a, a blind spot. So uh, I feel like you know sometimes just everyone has them. You know, just these areas uh, or, or these artists that you just haven't listened to, even though you think it would be up your alley. I mean, I have no excuse because I can pull these off the shelf at any point and put it on, uh, which I will. I will do that. Um, but it's just you know everyone has these kind of blind spots. Uh, but it's fun because you know this is still in front of me. You know, I get I get to discover David Bowie still. Uh, and that should be a lot of fun when I finally get around to it. But I don't want to force it. Uh, I like things to happen organically, so I like to hear something somewhere or whatever, um, and that's how I like to get into things, um, or like I said, organically. But um, this is an instance where these are sitting on the shelf. I might as well listen to them, huh? So we'll go through these alphabetically real quick. Uh, this is Aladdin Sane. Uh, this came out in 1973. Um, so this reached uh, number one in the UK. David Bowie was obviously he's English, so uh, he was huge over there. Uh, number 17 in the US. Um, we open this up. I mean, he's certainly a character. Sorry for the glare, but and, and sorry for the air conditioning. It's just it's I have to have air conditioning on right now. It's just too ridiculous without it. Uh, whoops, it's falling out of the bottom there. Um, you know, David Bowie. Yeah, it's, it's weird that people think he was, like, sexy. He's, I mean, I, I can see him being provocative uh, and different. Um, I just don't, I don't understand thinking that he's sexy. He's pretty gross looking, but <laughs> regardless, whatever. Um, let's take a look at the actual album. There's no, no sleeve on this one. Um, this is from uh, RCA. Sorry, you can hear my dog outside the door, too. Um, the Dynaflex, which we'll see also with, um, I believe, Ziggy Stardust. You see how it's like really kind of, I, I, I don't know if I should call it flimsy, but um, you can just easily bend it and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of weird. I mean, compared to the 180 gram, you know, stuff that you, that you come across now, I really don't know if, you know, 180 gram vinyl it feels nicer, it's heavy, but I don't know if it really matters in terms of the way it sounds. Um, but, you know, who knows? Some people claim it does. Oops, sorry. Like, you'll see 180 gram audiophile vinyl. Like, uh, that, you know, does that really matter? Um, Time, uh, obviously, is a big song. And then Let's Spend the Night Together, that was a Rolling Stone song. And you see Jagger Richard. His name's Richards. Uh, unless I'm missing something and his real last name is Richard or something, and that's how they credit him here. Uh, the Gene Genie was uh, the lead single off this, I believe. Let's see, like, I don't even know some of these songs, which is just kind of, you know, speaks to my ignorance of David Bowie. Um, and then on the back, something else that's interesting is um, they all have place names next to the songs, and at first I'm such a moron that I, I was like, is this a live album? But it's not the case. Um, this was originally going to be called... Well, this is D Bowie called this album Ziggy Goes to America, his character Ziggy Stardust, which you can see over here. Um, and these songs were written as observations about the cities or areas that are in the, the, the parentheses. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and then you see here J Keith Richard again. So, glad and sane. Uh, I should definitely listen to that one. Then we get uh, pinups. Uh, that is Twiggy, the model on the front, uh, who later became half of the namesake of Twiggy Ramirez, right, from Marilyn Manson. I can't believe I still know that. 
Uh, this came out in 1973 as well, so the same year as Aladdin Sand. It's amazing how um, artists would release uh, multiple albums a year, and now you're lucky to get one every three or four. Um, this also went to number one in the UK and number 23 in the US. Um, and it's a covers album, which is kind of interesting. Um, so these are London uh, London bands, uh, bands based in London, and he actually writes, it's hard to read this, but these songs are my favorites from the 64 to 67 period of London. Um, so he says who's on it, uh, them, Yardbirds, Pink Floyd, The Who, The Kinks, some other groups I haven't even heard of. Um, and the, the thing, interesting thing about this as well is that he originally planned to do a sequel to this. I forget what it was going to be called, but it was going to have like American artists that he really liked. So this was the London, you know, British one, and then he was going to do an American one, and that did not come to pass. But you see inside, this one actually has the original sleeve. There's not much really tremendously interesting. Um, but pretty cool nonetheless. And then this one, is this the Dyna disc one? Yeah. Oops, sorry. That's also the Dyna, Dynaflex, excuse me, um, where you can bend the shit out of it. Not that I would do that. Okay, and then the final is Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, Rise and Fall, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Um, this came out in 1972, so a year before the other two. Um, and this really broke him big um, in terms of you know, being a being a big deal. This hit number five in the UK and uh, number seventy five in the United States. Although it went up to twenty one after he died. Although business, uh, the Billboard charts now are, are essentially meaningless. Um, so it's a concept album. I have not listened to it, so I shouldn't really comment on it. But it's a concept album about like him as a human manifestation of an alien that wants to bring peace and love or something. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, K West was a uh, like a fur outlet in London. So this is like a this wasn't a set. This is like a real um, corner, like a real place in London. Um, and so they th that K West these signs are no longer there, but a plaque was put up uh, in this spot um, that says I, I haven't read the plaque. I just I read about it, but that you know they they. Um, photograph that at that spot. Uh, here he is in the back in a phone booth. Um, and I know the song Starman, um, Suffragette City, but again, my knowledge is just so limited. Kind of embarrassing. And then uh, you see to be played at maximum volume. That's exciting. I feel I never play anything at maximum volume. I guess I'm, I'm lame. Here's the, here's the band, David Bowie, Trevor Boulder, Mick Woodmancy, and that's uh, Mick Ronson, I think. So uh, let's see. Uh, and then lyrics on the other side. So that's my Bowie collection, and someday I will put these on, and I'll no longer be able to say I don't really know anything about David Bowie. So we'll see when that time comes. Next, um, this is Brewer and Shipley, Tarkio. Um, this was my dad's, I think, and just another kind of example, and there are a lot in my record collection of, of groups that had a hit, you know, charted at some time in the late 60s to early to mid 70s, never heard from again, and they just have been kind of lost to time. Like, you wouldn't know, I'd never heard of Brewer and Shipley before, but their song, One Toe Over the Line, um, hit number 10, I think, in the United States. So, that's a real hit, especially in 1970 when this came out. Um, I love this like, uh, hippy dippy uh, the m mustaches. These are Brewer and Shipley. I'm not sure which is which. And then on the back, this came out on Karma Sutra Records, which is a record label that I had not really heard of before seeing this, but they had some legit acts. I looked it up. Uh, over the period, I think they went defunct in the late 80s. Uh, they had Charlie Daniels. Um, Sha Na Na, uh, they had Love and Spoonful, and then they had the Fat Boys, which is kind of funny, uh, and Menudo as well, so, yeah. Uh, Jerry Garcia played pedal steel guitar on one of the songs. 
Um, let me open this up. It's just a plain white sleeve. The Kama Sutra labels are, are kind of colorful and kind of cool. Um, so these are folk. The, uh, Brewer and Tripoli. It's, see, it's called Tarkio Road on the on the label as well, but yet it's just called Tarkio um, on the sleeve and on the spine. Focus. Can hardly see it because it's in such bad shape. I apologize for that. That's where it would say Tarkio. Trust me. Um, so. Um, you know, they were, they were active in the late 60s, early 70s. This is when uh, this came out. Um, and funnily enough, um, that song, One Took Over the Line, Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president at the, at the time, um, said, oh, sorry, uh, said that song um, was blatant, quote-unquote, blatant drug culture propaganda that threatened to sap our nat national strength. So these guys, at least, you know, they were big enough to get the attention of the vice president. So... That is Brewer and Shipley. Never listen to this either. So uh, maybe maybe someday again. But pretty cool. Right, let's move on. We got a couple here. Uh, we got a couple Jackson Brown albums. Um, we got uh, Jackson Brown self-titled, and then The Pretender. Uh, this one came out in '72. This in '76. Um, this is his first album, and there's. Uh, people think it's called Saturate Before Using uh, because it says it at the top, and that's also on the spine of the CD. I don't think it's on the spine of the record, nothing is, but it's on the spine of the CD from my understanding. And this is meant to be, if you see the top with these like little um, the washers, this is meant to be a water bag. Like, well, that's the idea, is this is meant to look like a water bag. Um, and so that's why the water bags say saturate before using on them. So that was his idea. Um, the original pressings, uh, from what I read, felt like burlap. This one does not, but that's pretty cool. Uh, I wish I, I kind of wish I had that one. Um, and I guess that the record label, um, was begging him to get rid of the word saturate before using because they knew it would be confusing and it ended up being confusing because I thought that was the title at first as well when I when I pulled this out um, but they did not remove those words as you can see so this came out in 1972 on Asylum uh, this was actually if not the first Asylum Records was David Geffen's original record company and David Geffen was a champion of Jackson Brown from my understanding and he tried to, to get Jackson Brown signed to a record label uh, and was unsuccessful from what I read. So he started Asylum Records to put out Jackson Brown's material. I, I could have that a little bit off, but that's my understanding of it. This went to number 53 in the U.S. Um, Dr. Maya, I don't know these songs, which is just like, I, the Jamaica Say You Will, I think, was a Joe Cocker song, or maybe Joe Cocker covered it. Um, Dr. My Eyes was um, a top 10 hit in the U.S. Um, but I don't really know, you know, anything else about it. Albert Lee played the electric guitar on it. Um, David Crosby appeared on it as well, as you can see there. And this one actually opens from the top, which is something a little odd. Missing the original sleeve. Does not have the sleeve. Um, this blue Asylum label, that's sharp. I really like that. So that is the original self-titled album, and then I think this is his third or fourth album, Pretender. Uh, came out in 1976. Um, it hit number five in the United States. So he had become a much bigger deal at this point. Um, I still don't even know if I know any of these songs. I did put this on. I listened to this once. I listened to, I think, a side of it. I just didn't care for it. It was just... I don't know, um, a little too cheesy for me, uh, that's the way I'll put it. Uh, maybe I'm just not listening to the right stuff, but I didn't, I just wasn't into it, I'm gonna be honest. These were my parents, um, Bonnie Raitt and Lowell George from Little Feet appear, Graham Nash and David Crosby appear, produced by John Lando, longtime collaborator with Bruce Springsteen, you can't really read these notes there, unfortunately, and then there's some poem. He probably had a kid or something. 
but we wanted to put a poem on there. He just felt so good about that. Um, not that he's probably going to this. This does have the original sleeve, though, which is kind of cool. I mean, there's not much to it, but at least it, it's there. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's Jackson Brown. I don't anticipate getting more Jackson Brown albums unless they're given to me, to be honest. It's just not my thing. Next, uh, Dave Brubeck's Greatest Hits. Uh, Dave Brubeck, a jazz musician. You know, jazz is... I, I always like it when I hear it. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I just wanted to stretch out a minute. Um, but it's not like I don't know much about it, to be honest. Um, this whole thing. Um, it's not something... It's not a genre I've, I've particularly delved into. I'll put it that way. Um, this... The story behind this record is... Um, I first got a record player when I, shortly after I moved in with a couple of friends of mine in Somerville uh, back in 2011 and uh, when I first, I bought the record player and I had my parents' records and I bought a bunch of my own records right off the bat um, and brought them all home, set everything up, I was all excited and my roommates kind of got into it as well. So um, one of them, uh, my, my friend and, and former roommate Henry, um, he Bought, once I, when I moved out and took all the stuff with me, he, he bought his own record player and he bought a lot of records while we lived together and continues to, to buy records now. Uh, my other roommate, PJ, uh, for the first like week or two, was really into it. And uh, really, you know, was buying, uh, bought a, few, a handful of records and was really into it and stuff. And then all of a sudden one day he was like, this is stupid, why am I, I'm, I'm not gonna buy my own record player, why am I buying these records? So he stopped, but, um, he had bought a few records before he stopped, and this was one of them. And when I moved out, he basically just gave it to me. He was like, you can just have it if you want it. So I said, okay. Um, it's a nice, you know, like this kind of thing, like Take Five is, is a famous song from this. Um, it's a nice thing to put on, you know, on like a, a weekend morning or something, uh, or like on a holiday. I know that sounds so stupid, but like, you know, put it on like Christmas Eve. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, this is a reissue. The original album came out in 1969 on Columbia, as you can even see that. I cannot find information on when this came out. I'm sure I'm not looking hard enough, but this, this reprint. I, I think it's 2010, 2011, something like that. Um, but I can't seem to find the definitive info, even on Discogs. And then we got uh, just standard Columbia red label. Um, so it's a nice thing to have. Nice thing to have. Okay, we get a couple more. Uh, retrospective, The Best of Buffalo Springfield. Uh, this is a collection, obviously, of greatest hits for Buffalo Springfield. Came out in 1969 on, uh, as you can clearly see, Atco, um, future label La Pantera, and uh, ACDC. Um, Buffalo Springfield uh, was a band uh, that had uh, Stephen Stills and Neil Young in it, among other uh, members. Uh, those are the most famous. They went ob obviously to their own successful solo careers, but also you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and so on and so forth. Um, the band was only around from 1966 to 1968, uh, and then they reformed later. Um, this is in tough shape. As you can, I mean, this is not a gay fold. It's not supposed to open like that. Uh, I could glue it, you know. I probably should, just to make it a little better. Um, here's the classic Atco sleeve with all the crap that we looked at last time. Although, I looked at this more closely and they actually have some decent acts on here that would probably have sold a lot, um, like the Bee Gees, um, Cream, you know, there, there's, it's not Sunny and Cher at the time, Otis Redding, it's not as bad as I thought it was. Iron Butterfly, um, we made fun of this I think in the last election video. And the album itself is actually in really good shape considering how old it is. Uh, Mr. Soul's a great song, um, and For What It's Worth is the most famous song by Buffalo Springfield, and that is on here, isn't it? Oh, I probably missed it. It was up uh, above the, the hole. Yep. Um, so Buffalo Springfield, I mean, you know, I, I love Neil Young. Uh, I like CSN and CSNY fine. Neil Young is, is great. So this is a good thing to have as well. Um, never put this on either but this is actually something I would put on um, so and finally um, these are the final two records the birds um, birds greatest hits 
uh, and then Untitled, uh, which is a live slash studio recording. So we'll start with the greatest hits, uh, which was released in 1967 uh, on Columbia. Uh, it went to number six in the U.S. Um, the Birds, a uh, very famous group, uh, David Crosby, we'll, uh, them again. Um, see what was, what was on this uh, and it's so funny it's a lot a whole lot of Dylan Mr. Tambourine Man All I Really Want to Do Chimes of Freedom My Back Pages a lot of Dylan but you know the birds took folk and made it kind of psychedelic uh, and they were kind of really important to that to that movement and, and really to the you know to the evolution of, of that kind of sound that psychedelic sound um, this one's also in bad shape um, and I've, it's not that I've never really been a giant birds fan, but that doesn't mean that, you know, turn, 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 you know, how can you not like that song, uh, Mr. Spaceman, I mean, they're, they're good songs. Um, so here you see their previous albums, and then there's a little kind of like, uh, retrospective, uh, written about the band, which I love when they have these, and it's something, something to read when you're listening to it, which is really cool. Um, inside, we have the album itself, which, even though it has no sleeve, is in really good shape. Classic Columbia. Um, and lo look at this. This is an insert. Columbia stereo can be played on mono equipment. You see how this is a stereo recording? Uh, Columbia stereo records can be played on today's mono record players with excellent results. They will last as long as mono records played on the same equipment. It will reveal full stereo sound when played on stereo players. Just like in case... Yeah, stereo must have been new. Stereo systems to have at home must have been new. And uh, they wanted to assure people that if they had mono equipment, they could still use this and, and play this record. That's it's cool that that, that still has that. <clears throat> and then Untitled, which is interesting. Um, and, and before we get into the history of it, take a look at this. Like just the, this is an example of uh, you know those records were up in that attic for so long that it's just all warped. Uh, I have a few that are like that. I assume it still plays. The record looks to be in good shape. Um, it looks kind of funny when it's spinning around, like kind of like almost looks like it's moving around on the on the spindle. But um, yeah, they were up in a, an attic that went from 130 degrees down to like 10 degrees for 30 years. And it was also probably crushed. It's just, yeah, some of them are, are like that. but. You know, what are you going to do? It's too late to do anything about it. Um, this is a double album. And the first side, or, or the first LP, is a live recording. And the second, so you see side one, concert. And then the second LP is a studio recording. Um, this is at a point you can see inside with the band uh, Clarence White. Gene Parsons, no relation to Ram, Roger again, Skip Batten. Uh, David Crosby had left the group at this point. Uh, this came out in 1970, by the way. Um, so, there's a lot of interesting things about this album. First of all, it hit number 40 in the United States, number 11 in the UK, so they actually carried their... Um, it, it was critically um, beloved as well. It actually um, did really well. Um, the title... So, from what I read, Untitled was not the intended album name. Um, the, I think they were filling out some sort of form uh, to be sent to the record label uh, about like what the title should be. And they, whoever was filling that out, just put, whether it was a member of the band or, or a manager or something, I forget, um, just put Untitled in parentheses. Um, meaning like hold on we're figuring it out and they just went with it and printed it and everything even with the parentheses so the name the name is with the parentheses on it um, which is pretty pretty interesting and then something else that's interesting that I read and, and this is all courtesy of Wikipedia I'm not some savant um, but that Roger McGinn had been working on a Broadway uh, had been working with a Broadway theater director by the name of Jacques Levy uh, on a musical, and that musical fell through. It never ended up happening. Um, but a lot of the songs that had been written for it made their way onto this. Um, and I don't know whether... That might even be talked about in these liner notes. I'm not sure about that, but 
just kind of interesting nonetheless. Um, so birds, uh, I mean, they're good. I never listen to this either. Um, we'll see. I mean, someday, someday maybe. So finally the bees with the birds, the bees are done. We'll move on to uh, the seas and we'll do that next time. Thanks a lot.